Oh my god, there's so many spoilers, you have no idea. Yo, what's up? As it happens, downpour flora slash fauna is taking forever, so we're out here making tier list videos until I finally finish writing my dissertation on the wildlife in this godforsaken game. This video is going to be my tier list on all the Slugcat campaigns, where I rank how much I enjoy playing them. Therefore, this video is not based on facts, but rather based on my fat, juicy opinions. Which are correct, but you know, some people just prefer to be wrong about things. I understand, you know, that's why the girls in high school didn't think I was handsome. Anyway, uh, tier list. Let's start from the bottom. Big fat F tier. And the worst slug hat in the game is... Inv. Or Sofantheal. Or thanks, Andrew. Or question mark, question mark, question mark. Oh my god, who could have seen this coming? The joke slug cat designed to be unplayable is in fact unplayable. 10 food pips, super hard spawns and areas, shitty stats, certain areas being close to impossible. I'm looking at you, nachos. Yeah, inv is at the bottom. I don't think anybody's gonna be mad at me for putting them at the bottom. I mean, the jokes are funny, don't, d don't get me wrong, but if we're ranking like campaigns that I'd rather play again, I'm not gonna touch inv with a 10 foot pole. Anyways, let's get to the one that people are gonna be angry at me about. That one, the worst non-joke slug cat, is Artificer. All right, all right, before you lynch me in the comments, let me explain. Artificer on paper is a very fun slug cat. Great mobility, close to the strongest in combat, arguably tied with Gourmand, versatility in how you approach situations due to her bomb-making ability, good lore, good areas, it has fucking Metropolis. It's got a lot going for it. On her own, the Artificer is one of the most fun slug cats to play in game modes like Arena or Co-op, but we're ranking campaigns here, and there are two major features that fuck up her campaign to an extent where I'm rarely ever happy to play it. One, the Karma System. If you didn't know, Artificer has a special Karma System where she's constantly locked at the lowest Karma, the Violence Karma, and if she ever wants to pass through a gate, she either has to find Echoes, which is pretty fun, or has to drag a scavenger corpse up to the gate, which gives her a bonus of karma, which is randomized depending on what the scavenger had at the time. This is rarely ever fun. You, I don't like going on a, forgive the pun, scavenger hunt to find the proper body that I'm going to need to get from point A to point B, when it could be rewarded with skillful play like every other slug cat besides base saint. This also makes any deaths not matter, encouraging you to throw your face at the problem until it solves itself through RNG. This is far from an unsolvable problem. In fact, literally all you have to do is just give her slightly reduced karma, or something along those lines. The base karma system is probably one of the coolest game design decisions that this game has made, and I think it's done really well. Because Artificer is locked at violence karma, it means that she most of the time gets to ignore it, and whenever it comes into play, it's horribly tedious to have to look for where the scavengers are and hope that they don't pull a scavenger on you. Speaking of which, the scavengers. That's the second flaw, by the way, because Artificer's main enemy throughout the entire campaign is scavengers. Now, I like scavengers as a mechanic, drawing their ire for good loot or befriending them for easier passage through areas like Outer Expanse and Garbage Wastes is a really cool idea. It's reputation systems done well. The issue is that the whole reputation system that makes them fun is thrown out the window for Artificer, who is permanently locked at zero reputation, which means you're gonna have to deal with scavengers wanting to kill you for the whole experience. This wouldn't be a problem if scavengers were balanced in combat encounters. Now I get the idea of fighting a scavenger. It's like fighting a shittier version of you, and in packs, right? They can throw spears, they can use every tool that you can, I think they can even use flashbangs, right? But scavengers aren't a shittier version of you. They're a better version of you. They can carry more spears than you, they have more degrees of aim than you, have more health than you, and are oftentimes better equipped than you. And are generally just better than you in every degree besides perception. I've seen scavs land some of the craziest fucking spear parries known to man. I've seen scavs trick shot me from the craziest angles. They are better at Rain World than I could ever be. This mixed with their number advantage, incredible aim, and ability to insta-kill you with little to no wind-up from any range, makes them formidable opponents that you'll oftentimes want to avoid fighting at all costs. They were balanced around you not wanting to fight them. But for Artificer, you are constantly forced into combat encounters with them, against your will, and around every corner, meaning you are forced at multiple occasions to deal with the bullshit that is scavengers. 
I found myself oftentimes entering a room and getting nailed with a spear through a room transition before I can even react, simply because I don't have the magical premonition to know that fucking Sniper TF2 was holding a sight line just outside my fixed camera angle. Not to mention the close range combat. Oh, you appear to have speared me one time. Well, joke's on you, Artificer. I'm one of the scavs with slightly more health, and I just got up and stabbed you in the ass before you can react, because the game said that I could live a spear today. Oh, you just came out of a pipe, and have human reaction speed that requires you to see me and process my presence before you can respond to anything that I do? Die, beta! This generally frustrating combat mixed with the poorly designed boss fight at the end that is either stupid easy or downright impossible depending on how the King Scav AI feels like acting today means that the whole run can feel frustrating and like you're just throwing yourself at the game until it yields. On the bright side, Artificer does have a lot of tools to counter scavenger bullshit, like the parry, but it's an unrealistic level of skill to expect someone to have compared to every other slugcat in the game who ask for nowhere near the amount of technical precision, and it makes me not even want to learn more complicated movement and combat techs when I could just have more fun playing any other slugcat. Literally all my problems with Artificer come from her campaign. Everything else is fine. She's fun. I'm certain I'm going to enjoy playing her in challenge mode, but her campaign really does just ruin any enjoyment I could have of her. Also, it doesn't help that her map has the shitty garbage waste too, but we'll get to that when we talk about Spearmaster. Much later down the list. Next up, and onto the trio of boring slugcats. First up, Monk. Monk's only sin is being boring. He's the easy mode. He was an afterthought, added in so people could learn how to play before inevitably dropping him and moving on to the more fun survivor. I doubt there are any hardcore monk mains who love the gameplay of walking around the map while watching every local predator ignore you to chase butterflies. There are some nice changes, like the light that he gets in Shaded Citadel, the more forgiving karma system with different gates and more common flowers, and the low food requirements allowing you to take alternate paths without that much food. Additionally, the dialogue and small story he has about finding Survivor is neat, but Banana Boy still feels like an afterthought. He's got the least gameplay differences from the base template, too. He's literally just shittier Survivor, with worse spear damage, health, and strength. Additionally, when you play Monk in the base game, the game just punishes you if you try to get lore pearls by having them mostly be faded. I'm glad they fixed this with Downpour, because it felt kind of mean to punish people for playing the easy mode with things other than just the general boredom of having the game more or less play itself. On the bright side, he's a really funny meme character. I don't intend to be mean to Monk, I'm fond of Banana Boy, but this is a tier list so I've got to give my honest opinions, and my honest opinions are that Monk is really boring and really hard to write more than two paragraphs about. Next up in the trio is Hunter. My opinions on Hunter have changed a lot since I started the game. At first he would have been below Monk, but I've grown fond of him. However, he is generally still on the poo-poo shitto end of the tier list because of a few glaring issues. First off, he starts in Farmeries. They may have made the region better, but it still fucking sucks because you have two ways to go, either to Sky Islands or past two scav tolls to get to outskirts. So you either have to deal with Sky Islands or a Red Lizard. Additionally, the cycle count makes playing him notably more stressful than it would otherwise be, considering that if you get your karma lowered too much in one reason, it could downright softlock you or end the run entirely. Generally, I appreciate Hunter as a hard mode for hardcore players who want that roguelike or speedrun experience of completing your mission as fast as possible with as many cycles remaining, but with the advent of Downpour, that sort of hardcoreness of his hard spawns but stronger perks is no longer a unique feature to Hunter only, and it makes him feel like an odd middle ground between Artificer and Survivor. The lack of a gimmick besides the back spear really only leaves him with his time limit and his moon revival mission to set him apart from the other slugcats, neither of which are particularly fun or unique or compelling compared to the other downpour slugcats. Hunter got really shafted by downpour, I feel. Almost all of his individual gimmicks were taken and doled out to the other slugcats, leaving him feeling like a bit of a nothing burger campaign. He has good agility, but not as good as Rivulet. Good damage, but not as good as Gourmand. Can carry two spears, but can't make them like Spearmaster. It leaves him feeling like a middle ground for all three, which some people may like, but I find to be a little bit out of place. Now, Edgy Boy does still have a place in my heart as the base game's hardest campaign, though, and Hunter Longlegs is very cool, even if it's not actually in his campaign. Next up, and finalizing the base game trio, Survivor. Despite this man being my most played slugcat and remaining one of my personal favorites, I've gotta put him down here for the same reason I put Monk down here. He's boring. All the basic slugcats are more or less the same in terms of stats, and Survivor is literally the blank slate. He's 
pure white. He's also the poster boy of the game, and he's the icon of the basic Rain World experience, but like, how do I talk about Survivor? He's got my second favorite food requirements in the game, only beaten out by like, Saint Rivulet, I guess. He spawns in Outskirts, I suppose? He has a cool ending with Slug Pups and Outer Expanse now, but like, that's it. He's just Mr. Rain World, he's fucking Pikachu, there's nothing here. But hey, because there's nothing here, it means that there's nothing negative here. Anyways, every other slow cat from here on out is more positive than negative, in my opinion. It's kind of hard to get more mid than Survivor. Next up, Gourmand. Fat boy, boy is what I like to call the better version of the Hunter campaign, where you still have the innate goal of killing all the shit for the food quest, and the same spawns more or less, but you don't have the time limit and the whole thing is more lax and fun. Gourmand is also the most unique slugcat in terms of combat, having a unique spear throw and ground pound mechanic that leaves him doing a bunch more burst damage but suffering from exhaustion afterwards. I personally find the exhaustion on movement a bit much to play him too often as I enjoy moving, but for those that have a much better time turning the entire map into your bitch by insta-killing almost anything with combos, this might be your guy. Oh yeah, and the crafting system. I almost forgot to mention it. Generally, it's not as useful as you'd expect because bombs are really dangerous and most utility stuff isn't really worth it unless you're making deer food or bubble weed for certain farmer raids or drainage system rooms. However, a nice thing is that you can make pearls, and it's super easy. Any non-edible plant plus three rocks makes a pearl which means you have no reason not to get chiefed in the second that you see a group of scavengers. Gourmand also unlocks Outer Expanse, a super neat area that will score very high on the region tier list, which is probably coming out after this one, maybe, I'm not really sure. Either way, super good campaign with a lot of nice side objectives and an overall light tone that lets this be a comfort character for both casual players and hardcore kill everything fuck the world players. I just put it in mid tier because it doesn't really have much in terms of story, and the exhaustion mechanics can get really annoying. Next up, nearing the top, Spearmaster. Spearmaster is honestly just a really good slug cat. I'm struggling to come up with basic words, but he's just really fun and really, really good. To start off, I mentioned it in one of my trailer analyses for Downpour, but his food is fucking absurd! 10 food max, 5 food requirement. You can eat to full and not have to eat at all the next cycle. It's nutty and means that you can oftentimes forego hunting altogether for a cycle. Which is a good thing, because Spearmaster's main and only real weakness is that it's very hard for him to get food. Spearmaster's gimmick is that he makes spears, which I mean, hey, infinite free spears is really strong, you'll never have to show up to a fight underprepared. But he eats through throwing the spears, and gets one or less food from each spear hit, meaning his feeding power is based off the enemy's maximum health. So things like blue lizards, which would normally grant six food to Hunter, grant one to Spearmaster. However, you also have infinite spears and can hold two at a time. So you can just pepper anything from long range. Vultures? Fuck them. The rot? Eat up that cancer. Seeing a monster kelp is just three free food because it can't reasonably fight back. If Artificer is the Doom Slayer, Spearmaster is Master Chief. However, this infinite spear conundrum does come with a few drawbacks. One, you can't swallow anything. You gotta carry it around by hand. And two, an honestly pretty weird one, Spearmaster has difficulty fighting lizards. Lizards oftentimes require both a rock and a spear to kill if they see you first, but oftentimes Spearmaster will be walking around with two spears at any one time, meaning that you'll oftentimes be facing down a lizard with no way to break its head armor. But this isn't Spearmaster's only weakness. The most common criticism I see levied at Spearmaster is that his map is easily the most difficult out of all the slug cats. Artificer and Spearmaster both share the same garbage waste, and it is fucking rough, man. Horrible spawns acid everywhere, and much harder traversal in general is just a part of it. Now looks to the moon being intact may make her a fucking awesome area, but it does mean that she's very hard to reach, as you gotta climb up her leg and go through peripheral to get to her, meaning that a relatively easy objective in most runs is made a lot harder in Spearmasters. Additionally, the generally really hard creature spawns make Spearmaster a proper challenge despite how nuts he is on paper. This does lead to my personal main criticism with him though. His campaign is basically just a glorified fetch quest. Go to Pebbles, get your balls ripped off, carry your balls to Moon, carry your balls to Communications Arrays, you're done. While the emotion is there, primarily due to Moon and Pebbles being really well-written characters and a bit of Suns and NSH in there as well, gameplay-wise you're just ferrying a pearl from place to place, which is even more annoying considering that you can't ever swallow it. Overall, a pretty big issue, but not big enough to keep him from being very fun and a refreshingly fair challenge. Except Garbage Wastes. I'm never going there again. Next up, and the second best, Saint. Saint is a very good campaign. 
like would probably be number one. I'll explain why he's not later. To those more devoted viewers of mine, you might already know what I'm referring to. Anyways, Saint is probably my favorite campaign story-wise. It is huge for lore, focuses on the echoes, every area is gorgeous, and the spawns are all fucky, but cool types of fucky. Saint honestly could have been a whole expansion and I would have been satisfied. There is just so much there. Saint's world is in an ice age, which means that rain is replaced with an increasingly cold climate that will eventually freeze Saint solid and kill him. This heat system can be negated with a scavenger lamp, which I'm not a huge fan of, but whatever. Like, they, they don't create heat, they're slime mold in a shell, a, a, according to Boon. Either way, Saint is a pacifist. He can't throw spears at all, he can't eat meat, his weak little vegan body goes into a catatonic shock whenever he tastes blood, but he is quite mobile with his long grapple worm-esque tongue, allowing him to quickly traverse rooms and escape dangerous predators. Now, Saint's entire goal is to find every echo on the map, except one, and get to Karma 10. This journey will take him through some of my favorite areas in the game, such as silent exterior and undergrowth, and have some of the most compelling dialogue and background storytelling I've seen in any game. The solace of this world you've been living through for so long now, covered in snow, is really something else, and Moon's dialogue really adds to the finality of it all. This is the end of this era. But Saint would be number one if it weren't for a pretty major part of his campaign, the parts just before the ending. For those who don't know, once Saint reaches Karma 10, he enters Super Saiyan and gains the power of a gun. Metaphorically, it's he has an insta-kill blast that can kill anything, even Guardians and Leviathans. Now this is really cool, you spent the whole campaign running and hiding from all the scary shit, now you can just kill him instantly. Neat. So why would I bring it up as a negative? Well, the power is really clunky and hard to control. You're aiming a reticle with WASD after all, unless you're using a controller, in which case the door's right there. But that clunkiness can be somewhat forgiven. Except there's one little thing, Rubicon. The last area of Rain World is probably the worst designed part of all of it. Even the shittiest parts of Five Pebbles hardly come close to the downright awfulness that is this area. Rubicon is a mixture of the depths in almost every other area. It's filled with dangerous fauna that could come from anywhere, your only defense are the weak-ass spears given by the firebugs, and your powers. This is where the clunkiness comes in. Trying to hit a Miros Vulture with your slow-ass reticle as it dodges around it while you're trying to avoid its insta-kill attack feels awful. Having predators beeline it towards you at lightning-fast speeds as you keep fucking up the awful button input over and over again feels horrible. But hey, at least it's the end, right? Well, that would be the case, except for the fact that the area is fucking gargantuan. You have to fight your way through tens of rooms with almost no breaks from the onslaught. The game throws enemies not designed to be fought at you and expects you to deal with them with your very poorly handled powers. Miros Vultures have an insta-kill attack with no wind-up, and you're telling me I have to fight three of them in a room that looks like this? You're telling me that room is after three other arenas similar to it, and the nearest shelter is after another two rooms? Rubicon feels mean, more so than any other area. I understand it's not supposed to be a power trip, but if it's tough, make it shorter. Cut out all this bullshit down here, and just start up here. The actual ending that awaits you at the end is my favorite section in the entire game, but it feels kind of shitty coming off the back of your journey through what is defined in the game files as hell. Saint didn't need to end with Rubicon. Rubicon sucks, it blows, it's ass, and it ruins what could have been a super meaningful ending with what feels like malicious game design that tries to implement the logical extreme of difficulty in Rain World without any of the stuff that makes Rain World's brand of difficulty fun in the first place. Sorry for the long rant, but Rubicon really does stink, and I haven't really been able to air my grievances about it since I was stuck in it for an hour during my first playthrough. Anyways, uh, Saint is still an overall positive experience, but I think I'll just not take my trip through the orange zone next time I play the Fuzzy Frogman. And finally, you can probably guess who it is since it's the only one left, but the best slug cat in the game, in my opinion, is Rivulet. What I predicted in my trailer analysis was in fact true. Being Sonic the fucking slug cat is in fact a lot of fun. On its own, even if the story sucked, being as fast as Rivulet is with a strict time limit would be immensely fun. You have to manage your resources and prove your knowledge of the game map to get by. You can't just explore on Rivulet. You gotta know where you're going, which is great for me. Rivulet also gets to explore more of the watery sections of the game, as they have a really long timer before they start to drown, meaning that areas like Shoreline have a lot more potential routing. Now, I mentioned that this would be fun even without a good story. However, this campaign also has my second favorite story of all of them. In Rivulet's story, 
Five Pebbles has completely overtaken with Rot, and the area has been completely reworked. Good, because it takes that solidly F tier area to a solidly C tier area. Dealing with DLLs was rarely fun when you had normal slugcat speed and or constant zero gravity, but with rivulet speed and occasional low gravity, it is very fun to avoid. Having to watch out for the proto DLLs while avoiding the bigger and smaller versions through tight corridors is surprisingly entertaining. My only gripe with this area is that the objective for it is really hard to find because the overseer does not know where the fuck he's taking you, and following his lead led me in circles for an hour on my first playthrough. The rod is a very aesthetically pleasing area though, and the whole deal mixed with Five Pebbles' story of regret is all just a very neat thing. But that's not all there is to the story, because Moon also gets a spotlight. As Rivulet, you have to take Five Pebbles' balls, which you pried from the rot area, to Moon, and plant them thoroughly inside of her heart. This orb you have to carry around may take away your ability to hold spears, but it also makes you even more mobile, giving you lowered gravity and a super fast swim speed at the press of a button. This means that your journey through the submerged superstructure will be all the more fun. Getting to explore a properly underwater area in Rain Road without that much fear of drowning is super fun, and it's made all the better with the wildlife that inhabits the lower sections. You get to encounter leviathans in tight tunnels, aquapedes and jellyfish block your path, and eel lizards squirm about looking for a good meal. All of this is mixed with the wrecked iterator structure that made Silent Construct such a good area in Saint. But this still isn't all, because you get to deal with the area after this, Bitter Airy, which is, to be real, only a little small pathway back up to Moon, but still serves as a really neat look into Moon City. All of this culminating with a reconnection of Pebbles and Moon, reactivation of Moon, and a happy ending for the Slugcat too. It's a really good campaign, and is a highlight of Downpour, but even after all this, you can still explore the map with longer rain cycles than even Monk gets, making for an excellent post-game too. The literal only flaws I can think of in Rivulet is that the cycles where you wake up early in a flooded shelter are pretty annoying and are more frequent in early Rivulet, and that the Rod is an area can, as mentioned, be a complete fucking maze. But still, despite all this, Rivulet is, in my opinion, the ideal downpour experience. It's all I could have wanted from the DLC, a natural expansion on both the lore and gameplay that leaves me feeling satisfied at the end, and the fact that we got both this and Saint in the same expansion is a testament to how hard the MSC team in Video Cult worked. I know I shit on y'all a lot, but you really did kill it with this expansion. Great work. Anyways, that's my Slugcat tier list. If you disagree, be sure to tell me in the comments so I can laugh at how wrong you are. No, but seriously, feel free to post your own tier list. I'm curious how many people agree or disagree with me on this, because uh, I know my opinions can be pretty divisive, as shown by the region tier list video. Anyways, thank you all for watching, and I will see you in the next video. Bye bye